lecture, I'm going to give you an overview of the deep sea floor. Before I begin talking about the animals, I want to give some background. First, I want to explain where the deep sea begins. I'll then talk about the major habitats in the deep sea. Then I'll introduce the size classes of animals used by deep sea biologists. And finally, I'll tell you something about the way deep sea animals make a living. The deep sea begins at the edge of the continental shelf. This feature separates a basically shallow water fauna from a deep sea fauna. The deep sea consists of two very different major habitats. In one, food is produced locally by chemosynthesis. An example of this kind of habitat are the hydrothermal vents. In the second major habitat, food is produced elsewhere by photosynthesis and either falls or is transported into the deep sea. Within this habitat, there are two major types of, of bottom. Some places the seabed consists of rocks, and some places the seabed consists of sediment. These two types of habitat have very different faunas, and I'm going to talk about the fauna of soft bottoms. Deep sea biologists divide the fauna by size class. The largest organisms are the megafauna. Their lower size limit is measured in centimeters. And there are things like starfish and sea urchins. The macrofauna is the intermediate size class. Its lower size limit is 0.3 millimeters. And it's things like polychaetes and isopods. The myofauna are the smallest animals. Their lower size limit is 0.03 millimeters. And they're things like foraminifera and nematodes. Deep sea animals make their living in a variety of ways. Some feed by ingesting sediment and extracting food from it. And these are deposit feeders. Some feed on large food parcels like dead whales that fall to the seafloor. These are called scavengers. Some feed by collecting food parcels from the water. These are suspension feeders. And some feed as carnivores. They select and consume living prey. Now I'm ready to start talking about deep sea animals. And I want to begin with the myofauna, the smallest size class. The first group I want to talk about are the foraminifera. Deep sea biologists call them forams. And they have their own phylum. Forams are usually less than a millimeter in their largest dimension. Foraminifera are single-celled. They make a shell in which to live. The shells can be of two types. Some are built of calcium carbonate, and some are built of organic material. Sometimes forams appear to have multiple chambers, but this doesn't change things. They are still single-celled animals. The second most important feature of the foraminifera is their pseudopods. These are cell material that extend through the holes in the shell and out into the environment. Some forams live on the sediment surface. Some live in the sediment to about five centimeters in depth. Forams are the most abundant of the myofauna. A typical value might be one million individuals per square meter. Forams can move. They use the pseudopods to pull the shell along. If they want to remain immobile, they can use the pseudopods to anchor. Foraminiferans use their pseudopods to feed. Most species collect food from the sediment surface, therefore they're deposit feeders. A few species use their pseudopods to feed on food particles in the near bottom water, and they're suspension feeders. The next most abundant myofauna group is the nematodes. They are commonly called roundworms or threadworms. Deep sea biologists just call them nematodes, and they're their own phylum. Nematodes tend to be between 0.2 and 0.4 millimeters, but some are much larger. Nematodes are worm-shaped, and they're round in cross-section. Not all nematodes look the same. Some are very plump, and some are very skinny. Most nematodes live on or in the sediment. Most live in the upper 5 centimeters, but some have been found as deep as 20 centimeters into the sediment. I'm showing here some data from the Pacific. Notice that above 4,000 meters depth, nematodes have a typical value of about 300,000 per square meter. But notice deeper than that, abundances are much lower. 
it will be interesting as data accumulate to see whether this dramatic difference at about 4,000 meters persists. Nematodes move by making wave-like motions of their body. This allows them to move across the sediment surface, it allows them to burrow, and a few of them can even swim. Not much is known about the feeding of deep-sea nematodes. In shallow water, we know that some eat bacteria, many are deposit feeders, and a few are carnivores. And we make the assumption that the members of the deep-sea nematode fauna are doing sort of the same thing. The next most abundant myofauna group is the harpactacoid copepods, usually known as harpactacoids. They are crustacea, and they're an order of the subclass copepoda. Harpactacoids are small. Most are less than one millimeter in body length. Harpactacoids have three body regions, a cephalosome in the front, a mesosome in the middle, and a urosome in the back. The cephalosome bears two pairs of antennae, mouth parts, and one pereopod. The mesosome bears three pereopods, the urosome bears one pereopod, and a caudal ramus. Harpactacoids come in a great variety of body shapes. Some are smooth, like the specimen on the left, and some have amazingly complicated and large spines, like the specimen on the right. Most harpactacoids live in the sediment. Some live on the sediment surface, and a few alternate between the seabed and the near bottom water. Harpactacoid abundance in the shallowest portion of the deep sea can be about 200,000 per meter squared. But as you go deeper, the air abundance declines until in the deepest portion of the deep sea, you might find only a few tens to 100 individuals per square meter. In terms of mobility, some are practically swim, many walk on the sediment surface, and many more burrow. Not much is known about the feeding of deep sea harpactacoids. Most are thought to be deposit feeders because when we look through the body wall, we can see sediment in their guts. At least one is a carnivore because it's been photographed eating a nematode like a piece of spaghetti. Continuing with the myofauna, the kynorinka are next. They're sometimes called mud dragons, but deep sea biologists call them kynorinks. They are a class in the cephalorinka. Kynorinks are small. They're all less than a millimeter. Morphologically, kynorinks have three body regions. They have a head, which is sometimes called the introvert. They have a neck, and they have a trunk. The head's the very most interesting part of the kynorink, I think, because it uh, can be extended out and then withdrawn into the animal. And the animal does most of the things it needs to do as an organism using that head. Here are some scanning electron micrographs that show the complexity of the head in more detail. Kynorinks live strictly in the sediment. Kynorinks are much less abundant than the other myofauna tax that we've talked about so far. Notice that a typical value for the Pacific might be about 10,000 per square meter. Kynorinks use their head to move when they want to they just extend the head out, use the spines to grip the sediment, and then they partially invert the head, which pulls the body along behind. Kynorinks feed with their head. In shallow water, their diet includes microalgae and dead organic material. We know almost nothing about their diet in the deep sea. That's it for the myofauna. Let's move up the size class and talk about the macrofauna. The polychaeta is the group that's most abundant of all the macrofauna. They have a common name, bristle worms, but deep sea biologists just call them polychaetes. They are a class of the phylum Panellida. The smallest polychaetes are a few tenths of a millimeter long, while the largest can be a few millimeters to a centimeter long. The morphology of polychaetes is straightforward. They have a pre-segmental region called the head. That's followed by a segmented trunk and then a post-segmental region called the tail. Each segment has a parapodium on each side, and the parapodia bear a kiki. Polychaetes use a wide variety of habitats. Some live on the sediment surface. 
Some move freely through the sediment. Some build structures in which to live, like the one I show in this image. Finally, some live in burrows. The data on polychaete abundance is noisy. There's no clear pattern of depth. Clearly, some places have uh, more than a thousand individuals per square meter. Others have just a few tens to a hundred individuals per square meter. Many polychaetes are mobile. Of those that are, some just use their paracodia. Others undulate their bodies. Polychaetes make their living in a variety of ways. A great many are deposit feeders, and of those deposit feeders, a great many are bulk deposit feeders. Many of the deposit feeding polychaetes are selective, like the one I'm showing in this illustration. It uses tentacles to reach across the sediment surface and pick up bits of food. Some polychaetes are suspension feeders, and some are carnivores. The next group I want to take up is the Paracarida. Paracarids belong to the Crustacea, and they have their own super order. Three of the orders of Paracarida are remarkably important in the deep sea. The Paracarids have three body regions, a head, a middle section called the Perion, and a back section called the Pleon. The head bears two pairs of antennae and mouth parts. The Perion bears periapods. The pleon bears pleopods, uropods, and in some orders, a telson. The first paracarid group I want to talk about is the amphipoda. These are called beach fleas or amphipods, and they are an order of the paracarida in the subphylum crustacea. Most amphipods are between 1 and 10 millimeters in body length, although there are some giants out there. If you look closely at the rule in the picture on the right, you'll see that this animal is more than 10 centimeters long. The body of amphipods is arched if you look from the side, and if you look down on them, they are laterally compressed. The body of amphipods is identical to the generalized paracarid. Most amphipods are associated with the seabed. Some alternate between swimming and burrowing. Some live in tubes. In contrast to the amphipods I've just described, some live in the near-bottom water. Many amphipods are selective deposit feeders. Others are scavengers of carcasses that fall to the seafloor. The next paracarid order I want to talk about is the isopoda. These don't seem to have a common name. Deep sea biologists just call them isopods. They are an order in the superorder paracarida, and they're crustaceans. Isopods differ from amphipods. They're not arched in lateral view, nor are they laterally compressed. If anything, isopods tend to be dorsoventrally flattened. Isopods differ from amphipods in another way. In amphipods, you have the telson, but in isopods, the telson is incorporated into the last pleonal segment to make a pleotelson. Isopods differ in another way from amphipods. In isopods, one of the preonal segments is incorporated into the head, and it's now called a cephalon. Here's some pictures of deep sea isopods in dorsal view. Notice the great variety of form among them. Some deep sea isopods alternate between the sediment surface and the near bottom water. Most, however, live on or in the seabed, and some live in burrows. The data on isopod abundances are noisy. Note that in some part of the deep sea, there can be a few hundred isopods per square meter, but in some places, there may be only a few individuals per square meter. Some deep sea isopods walk on the surface of the sediment. Some deep sea isopods walk across the sediment surface. Some deep sea isopods burrow, and some deep sea isopods swim. Not much is known about the feeding of deep sea isopods. Most appear to be selective deposit feeders, but some have massive jaws that seem suitable for crushing calcareous forams. The third order of paracarids that is abundant in the deep sea is the Tenedacea, and their common name is Tenaeids. Tenaeids are a millimeter to a few centimeters in body length. 
the body is long and slender, and in cross-section, it's dorsoventrally flattened. Like isopods, but unlike amphipods, they have a pleotelson rather than a telson. In contrast to isopods, an additional segment has been incorporated into the head region, so we now have a cephalothorax. As a result, the perion now has six segments rather than seven. The morphology is much as you'd expect. The cephalothorax bears two pairs of antennae and the mouth parts. The perion bears periopods, the pleon bears pleopods, and the pleotelson bears uropods. Some tineids live on the surface of the seabed, some make tubes in which to live, and some burrow. The abundance data for tineids are noisy. In some places, there can be hundreds of tineids per square meter. In other places, there can be just a few. Some tineids deposit feed, some suspension feed, and some are predators. The next group of macrofauna I want to talk about is the bivalvia. They have lots of common names. These are the clams, the oysters, the cockles, the mussels, and the scallops, although deep sea biologists tend to just call them bivalves. They are a class of the phylum mollusca. Deep sea bivalves are less than a millimeter to a few centimeters in maximum body diameter. Bivalves have a shell that consists of two valves. The shell is made of calcium carbonate. A hinge connects the valves and a muscle closes the valves and can keep them closed and bivalves don't have a head. Here's a simplified view of a bivalve with one valve removed. Water enters through an incurrent siphon, flows over the gill, and then is directed back out via an excurrent siphon. The gill is the site of respiration, and in many bivalves, it is where they extract food particles from the water flowing by. The other interesting organ is the foot. Bivalves live in the seafloor. The data on bivalve abundance are noisy. In some places, there can be several hundred per square meter, but in other places, there may be only one or two per square meter. Some bivalves are sessile, others burrow through the sediment using their foot. Most bivalves deposit feed, some are carnivores, and a few suspension feed. The next macrofaunal group is the gastropoda. These are the snails. They are a class in the phylum mollusca. Gastropods can be millimeters to centimeters in body length. Gastropods have a calcium carbonate shell. They have a head that carries two tentacles and a mouth. In the mouth is a radula, which is a toothed ribbon-like structure used in feeding, and they have a muscular foot. Many species of gastropods live on the sediment surface, and some burrow. To move, they make a rippling motion of their foot. Some gastropods are scavengers, some are deposit feeders, and some are carnivores. Now I'd like to take up the animals in the largest size class, the megafauna. Asteroidea are the starfish. They're a class in the phylum Echinodermata. In the deep sea, starfish are a few centimeters to a few tens of centimeters in diameter. Starfish are radially symmetric and dorsoventrally flattened. Starfish have a central disc that bears arms. Usually there are five arms. There are skeletal plates of calcium carbonate, and the mouth is on the bottom. If you make a section through the arm of the starfish, you can see the tube feet extending through the skeletal plates. Starfish live in or on the seabed. Starfish use their two feet to move. The Ophuroidea are the brittle stars. They're a class in the phylum Echinodermata. The distance between arm tip and arm tip for brittle stars can be a few centimeters to as much as 60 centimeters. Brittle stars have radial symmetry. They have skeletal plates of calcium carbonate and five slender arms that are easily broken off, thus the name brittle star. As in starfish, the mouth of the brittle star is on the bottom. Some brittle stars crawl up sessile animals and perch, but most live on or in the seabed. Brittle stars use their arms rather than their tube feet to move. 
Some brittle stars are scavengers, some are deposit feeders, and those that are perched up on taller organisms are suspension feeders. The next group is the Echinoidea. These are the sea urchins. They're a class of the phylum Echinodermata. The test diameter of sea urchins tends to be between 3 and 10 centimeters, but a few as large as 28 centimeters have been observed. There are two kinds of sea urchins. Regular sea urchins have bifold symmetry. In lateral view, their test is hemispherical. The test contains calcium carbonate plates, and it can be rigid if the plates are close together, but if they're separated a little bit one from another, the test can collapse. And, of course, the mouth is on the bottom. Regular sea urchins have movable spines. In contrast to regular sea urchins, irregular sea urchins are not round in dorsal view, and if you look at them sideways, they can appear to be bilaterally symmetrical. Regular sea urchins live on the sediment surface. Irregular sea urchins live in the sediment. Sea urchins mainly use their two feet to move, but spines can be involved. Regular sea urchins eat algae and seagrass that has been washed away from shallow water and has fallen into the deep sea. They also deposit feed. Irregular urchins mainly deposit feed, but some of them can maintain an opening from their lower position up to the water column, and therefore they can suspension feed. The last group is the holothuroidea. These are the sea cucumbers. They're a class in the phylum Echinodermata. Most sea cucumbers are between 10 and 30 centimeters of body length. Most sea cucumbers are sausage-shaped. They look bilaterally symmetrical, but if you take a slice through them, you can see that they are radially symmetrical internally. Sea cucumbers have a leathery skin, and they don't have arms. In sea cucumbers, the mouth is surrounded by tentacles, and the body has tube feet. Some sea cucumbers live in the sediment, but most live on the sediment surface. They can be solitary or live in groups. Remarkably, some sea cucumbers can leave the sediment surface and swim up into the near bottom water. The sea cucumbers that swim do so by flapping their bodies. The non-swimmers move using their tube feet. A few sea cucumbers have enlarged tube feet, which they walk on like legs. Some sea cucumbers suspension feed, they use the tentacles around the mouth. Some scavenge, and some are deposit feeders of the bulk ingesting type. Here's a list of some other interesting taxa that I didn't have a chance to cover.